redistricting of the people, by the people, and for the people. With apologies to President Abraham Lincoln, let us consider how the redistricting of the people will take place following the 2020 census. Will it be done by and for the people, or to the people by those who currently hold elected office? To lay the groundwork for this discussion, let us review the Constitution, consider state guidelines, and take advantage of geospatial technology. Among the founding fathers, I've always been drawn to John Adams, in part for his attention to process and structure. And he had an excellent partner in his tenacious wife, Abigail. Neither were free from the foibles that plague women and men, but John Adams wanted to figure out how to make government work for the long term. This interest might have stemmed from my parents taking my sister and me to see the movie 1776, based on the Tony Award-winning musical, which dramatizes the challenges faced by someone lacking the charm of Jefferson and the height of Washington. John Adams drafted the Massachusetts Constitution in 1780, but he was serving as ambassador to Britain when the United States Constitution was written, so he did not play a part in the Connecticut Compromise, which provided for a popularly elected lower chamber, the House of Representatives, based on population, and an upper chamber, the Senate, with two members from each state, initially elected by state legislators. Adams was wary of the legislative branch, but elected bodies remained key to our government structure. The federal system has been described as one of the most geographically expressive of all forms of government. As a geographer, I wanted to explore the spatial dimensions of apportionment and redistricting. While I am focusing on the national level, specifically congressional districts for the United States House of Representatives, these concepts can be applied to state, county, and municipal governing bodies. Electoral districts, lines drawn on a map, not really that compelling, unless you happen to be an electoral cartographer, or someone who is on one side of a line and think that you and maybe a whole bunch of other people should be on the other side. As with representative bodies, district lines occur at many scales, from school boundaries to country borders. You may not be able to see these lines when you look at the earth, but they do manifest themselves in multiple ways. We should want to know who is grouping us where, with whom, and why. I reside in a congressional district in Colorado where one party has held the seat since the district's creation in 1973, although statewide races are competitive among parties. We elect representatives geographically, and district lines have been fought over since the early days of the Republic. We toss out the term gerrymandering as shorthand for partisan manipulation of electoral districts, possibly forgetting that Elbridge Gerry was a real person signer of the Declaration of Independence, diplomat in France, governor of Massachusetts, friend of John and Abigail Adams, and fifth vice president of the United States. In 1812, he bowed to pressure from Democratic Republicans in the Massachusetts State Legislature and signed a bill to redraw district lines favoring his party rather than the Federalist, who had actually won the popular vote. Except for dedicated students of history, this is all we remember about Elbridge Gerry. States are responsible for drawing district lines at the federal and state level. The organization Draw the Lines PA encourages conversation to illuminate guidelines map makers might use. One of these is party advantage. Think of this as maps that enable a political party to win as many seats as it can within the rules. But what are the rules? Who are the rule makers? Is manipulation of electoral districts any more or less egregious today than when the Massachusetts General Court did it in 1812? Then as now, one sign was deviation from county boundaries. Keeping political entities intact, cities, towns, water districts, 
should be honored when other essential criteria are not contradicted. Drawing districts with equal population is a constitutional requirement, but has only been enforced since the early 1960s. Over time, the population of the country, as well as the number of states and their representatives increased. Membership of the House of Representatives was set at 435 in 1911. Yet, many districts remained static. As people shifted, lines did not. Gerrymandering was accomplished by doing nothing. Those in power, primarily state legislators, did not want to redraw district lines in, in spite of the Constitution's directive to allocate representation based on information obtained every 10 years from the federal census. In 1964, when deciding Reynolds v. Sims, Chief Justice Warren wrote, diluting the weight of voters because of place of residence impairs basic constitutional rights. Geographers, looking at the world through a spatial lens, agree. Most districts are contiguous. A squiggly line might not reflect gerrymandering, but rather a mountain range. Massachusetts' 9th Congressional District includes the South Shore, South Coast, Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. Contiguity can have a variety of interpretations, but generally is a useful constraint among map makers. Compact districts offer the advantage of a tidy appearance, spreading out from a center point to smooth boundaries. However, as with contiguity, context is important to understand perceived irregularities. Geographers, political scientists, legal scholars, and mathematicians have attempted to address whether a district is reasonable by introducing statistical and geometric tests. Contiguity and compactness serve as building blocks for drawing electoral districts. Let's add communities of interest. The Pikes Peak region hosts multiple military installations. The Air Force Academy, Peterson, Schriever, and Cheyenne Mountain Air Force bases, Fort Carson. We also have 240 defense contractors in the Colorado Springs area. That is a sizable community of interest. Others could be identified by age, ethnicity, cultural connections, socioeconomic characteristics, neighborhoods, or employment. Say farmers. Think about your groups and identities. Do you have a voice? Fair districts avoid diluting a community. About seven states include incumbent protection as a traditional redistricting criteria, mainly to leverage seniority. Ten states encourage the goal of competitive elections, also known as responsiveness. In the 2014 congressional election, just six House of Representative districts were determined to be true toss-ups. In the most recent election of 2018, that number swelled to 82. That is a significant increase, but look at the math another way. That means we still had 353 races where you were pretty sure you knew who the elect office holder would be at the end of election day. What constitutes a competitive district? Is it a matter of choosing an equal number of people from each major political party? What about independents? How do we account for them? You can see we are quickly moving from data such as population, which can be manipulated in multiple ways, to subjective factors such as competitiveness, which are more difficult to critique and assess. Equal population and minority rights serve as an umbrella for all electoral races. Recall what the landscape looked like for minority voters prior to 1965. Primarily in southern states, but not exclusively. African Americans were subject to literacy tests for registration, poll taxes, harassment, and other barriers to voting that white citizens did not face. 
The Voting Rights Act addressed these issues and allowed cases to be brought against jurisdictions that had been pro permitting discriminatory redistricting. In 2013, the Supreme Court nullified certain provisions of the Voting Rights Act, leading to more restrictive voting procedures in some states and less oversight of district construction. There is a great deal more, one could say, about the Voting Rights Act. But for our purposes, let us confirm that minority voters should not be prevented from being able to elect a candidate of their choice. These criteria are starting to pile up. We will have to make some choices. If states violate one of the other guidelines to meet the equal protection or the racial equity criteria, the courts will be supportive. Choosing among these criteria to create fair districts is no simple task. Let's review our goals and guidelines for drawing electoral districts. Start with equal population, keep it contiguous, make it compact, avoid splitting political jurisdictions, maintain communities of interest, allow it to be responsive, comply with the Voting Rights Act, give one party or faction an advantage over another. Hold on, what about that last one? Is that a guideline we want to enshrine when drawing electoral districts? What would John Adams say? Ironically, this champion of the executive branch, our founding father devoted to process, well understood the proper construction of a legislature. In 1776, he wrote, the principal difficulty lies and the greatest care should be employed in constituting this representative assembly. It should be in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason, and act like them. Great care should be taken to effect this and to prevent unfair, partial, and corrupt elections. While we may not all be skilled cartographers, we can take advantage of geospatial technology and online mapping tools to begin to construct fair electoral districts for each state. Along with several other geographers, I developed the GeoCivics Project to enable people across the country to join the redistricting process. Let's see how this might work in Massachusetts. We need to know how many people live in a state and where they are. We will use 2010 census data. In Massachusetts, 14 counties, there are 6.5 million people. However, the county of Nantucket has 10,000 people, while the Middlesex County has 1.5 million people. This is evidenced by the proportional symbols on the map delineating relatively large or small population by county. To illustrate the process for dividing a state into districts, take the total population, 6.5 million. To keep this manageable, we will only divide population by county. To start, assume a state has just two congressional districts. So dividing by two, that equals 3.2 million people. Let's create District 1 using three contiguous counties, Middlesex, Essex, and Suffolk. That population is 2.9 million, 305,000 fewer people than is required to create two roughly equal districts. However, with this tool, we cannot incorporate any of the smaller counties because then the district would not be contiguous. The remaining 11 counties have a population of 3.5 million. So District 1 and District 2 together equal 6.5 million, the state's population in 2010. Imagine Massachusetts is Rhode Island with just two congressional districts. Our work would be complete. We would have complied with equal population, contiguity, compactness, and maintaining political jurisdictions. Communities of interest and the Voting Rights Act were not addressed but we have a roughly more urban and a more rural district. Massachusetts, of course, has nine representatives in Congress, and this is what its congressional district map looks like today. Projections for the 2020 census suggest that Massachusetts will retain its nine members in the House of Representatives, but internal migration will require redrawing district lines. 
of course, to undertake redistricting properly, we must use a tool that divides population at a scale finer than that of the county, but I suggest we work up to that task. We have used an accessible online mapping tool to divide a state into congressional districts. This tool is slightly less sophisticated than those which will be used throughout the country following the 2020 census to divide districts in, in each state. Everyone should take an interest in the redistricting process because the end result affects how we are governed. We should give attention to how the lines are drawn, by whom, and under what circumstances. We should want to know who is grouping us where and why. We should be equipped to ask questions of the, of the cartographers and of the people giving instructions to the cartographers. So join me in exploring geocivics. Take up your map, examine the relevant data, draw some lines, lead us to government of the people, by the people, and for the people through fair, do-it-yourself congressional districts.